And as a result of our conceit and our arrogance, we like war and we love violence. And the more moral views that are out there, the more likelihood that you're going to have violence in the world. And I found some very disturbing but interesting statistics on some of the violence that we've seen. One reason why people like violence is because they want to get rid of anybody who looks different than them. Walks or talks different than they are, they want them all gone. In Rwanda, the Hutus killed over one million people in 100 days. That means for every minute six people were executed only because they were different. They wanted them exterminated. They wanted just one set of people. You go on a little bit further, we find in history as well, people like to control other people. And that leads to all sorts of violence as well. We have Napoleon Bonaparte. 2.5 million military and 1 million civilians would die by the time his campaign was done. And his campaign was focused on, I want to control Europe. I want to be the only one in charge of Europe. He almost succeeded. But then he lost the battle in the end. And let's not forget, money certainly starts all sorts of wars. Do you realize that Hitler, one of his number one reasons why he started his campaign, originally wasn't to go after the Jews and kill them all. It actually was money. He went to Germany and he found out, we're poor. We don't have any money. We just went through World War I. We lost. The Treaty of Versailles put a whole bunch of conditions on Germany. They had no money. Everybody was destitute. And Hitler came along and said, i got a cure to all your woes. Let's go to war. Let's go take money from other people. That's how it started out. And then he went after power. And then he started persecuting anybody he found. 100 million military people would be involved in World War II. And out of that, between 60 and 80 million people would die. All because somebody said, I want money. Start out with, and then I want power. The reality is that Satan's kingdom is violent. And that's exactly the way he wants us. Matter of fact, if he finds out you're not a Christian, if he can get you killed early in life, he likes that. He wishes that on every one of them. Because if he can get you to hell a little bit quicker, he loves that because then you won't have an opportunity to say yes to God. The shorter your lifespan as a non-Christian, the happier he is. That's why we have wars. That's why we have so much violence. The kingdom of God is different, though. The kingdom of God says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. While one is created based on violence, one is created on love. God says your focus should be on him and on the people around you. It was a radical kingdom. If you remember in the New Testament, it says we should mimic Christ. We should be like him. We should walk like him, talk like him. We should do everything that he would do if he was here. Because we are his ambassadors. We're his priests. And I got thinking about that. A lot of philosophers have tried to figure out what Jesus was like. I did a course on this. It was on the Gospels. And these fellows did a whole bunch of research on historical ideas, thoughts and ideas, history, Bible, everything they could find. And together they came up to what they thought was a portrait of Jesus. And they said, I think we found Jesus. This is what he's like. This is the way he walked and talked and acted. And if you mimic him, you'll be just like him. But the problem was, is that while they were trying to do that, while they were looking for Jesus, they found something else. Something that was completely different than what they expected. And this is a criticism that most people give to those who look for a portrait of Jesus. And that is, every time they would look for the portrait, they would look into a mirror. And they would say, well, you know, I've been looking for Jesus for a long time. I found him. He's in the mirror. They would look at their own lifestyle, their own worldviews that were still a lot like Satan's. And they would look in the mirror and say, I've already obtained perfection. I'm already holy. I don't need to change. I'm already in love with God. And I'm already mimicking Christ. It's like somebody looking in the bottom of a well and seeing your own reflection and saying, ah, there's Jesus. There's not Jesus. We're not there yet. And it's an ongoing process of becoming like him. And it was a radical kingdom in which God introduced through his own son. My kingdom, Jesus says, not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight. They would get me off the cross. My angels would come down, tens of thousands of them, and take care of everything for me. Not a single part of my body would be hurt. And that's not what Jesus said. The Jewish people expected it. They really did they thought when Jesus came that he would come and he would show them power, real power. Because in the Old Testament it says Jesus would make everybody their footstool, his footstool. And everybody would bow to Jesus. And they thought, well, if that happens, 
Since we're God's chosen people, does that mean that we're going to rule the world? The Jewish people thought they were. And the reality is, it didn't happen. And they didn't like that. That was not what they were expecting. They didn't want a Jesus that died. They didn't want a Jesus that would, would come and suffer for the people. They wanted a Jesus who would have power and control and pass that to them. We're all out like that. Because when we have one worldview, the old one from our old sinful nature, we kind of like that idea of power and money. And we like to hang on to that. When Jesus says you can't, we don't find it very good. We try to buck it. The other thing is, is that Jesus came along and said, the entrance into the kingdom would no longer be based on your genealogy. It wasn't just the Jews that would get to heaven. It was all people. He said to the prostitutes, to those people who are tax collectors, he said, you're more likely to get to heaven than the Jewish people are. Because the Jewish people were not focused on God. They were focused on themselves. They were supposed to be a light unto the nations. And they were supposed to bring people into the church. It's not what they did. They left the Gentile people outside of the temple. And the Gentile people weren't allowed in. And that's not what God said for them to do. They sinned, just like oh, we all sin. And we're all guilty of the same problem. They focused on themselves. And Jesus said, all people can come know Jesus. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in the Lord Jesus Christ will get eternal life. That's all that's required is belief, not genealogy. Again, the world didn't like that as a new world kingdom. And the last part that disturbed people even more was the fact that we would get this gift called the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit would be within us. And now we would see clearly. So now when we go to the mirror, instead of looking through the dirty glass from this window, now we can actually see pretty clear of what's inside that mirror. We look in the mirror and we see a shape and a form of the image of God. But that's not where Jesus stopped. He said, it's great that you see the image of God when you look in the mirror. I want just a little bit more from you because there's something else in the mirror that you won't look at, that you should. And he said this, since no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him, no one can continue <coughs> sinning. Do not be conformed to this world, but allow your mind to be renewed. That means that when I look into the mirror, while I see the eyes of Christ, the potential of what I could be, I also see the sin that's in my life. I acknowledge I have sin. 1 John 1, 8 and 9 says, if you don't think you have sin, you're a liar. We all have sin. Everyone does. And God asked us to look into the mirror and see the sin and do something about it. That's why he talks about the renewing of the mind. Do you realize the majority of your time you spend out in the world? The majority of the time you're not in church. The majority of the time you're not reading God's holy word. The majority of the time you're being influenced by people out there. And they're telling you any worldview goes. And they're selling their worldview to you. That's why scripture says you've got to renew your mind. You are influenced by the people around you. And that's why scripture says... Pray to God. Read His Holy Word. Flesh out the sin in your hearts. Renew your mind every day. Because the world's always selling you something that is wrong. Always a sin. Look into the mirror and see the eyes of Christ. God calls us to be holy because He is holy. And we've got to try to work towards that. But most of us in the church don't look in the mirror. And when we do, all we see is our own image. And we say there's Christ. We're not quite there yet. The other part about loving God is also loving other people. We've got to love the people that are around us. You know the biggest effect that Jesus had on the people that were around him? The biggest thing that they talked about Jesus the most was his compassion. They looked at Jesus, and every time they healed somebody, it says in scriptures he had great compassion for them. And then he went up and he healed the blind and said it. It also says when Lazarus died, and Jesus came up the tomb, it said Jesus had huge compassion for Lazarus and his family, and, and called forth and said, come out of the tomb. And Lazarus came back to life. It's our compassion that defines our love too as well. Not only do we have to have a good relationship with God, but with one another. While the world is violent, and it certainly is, <clears throat> instead of us going out in the world and saying, if you're violent towards me, I'll be violent towards you, God says that's not the way to do it. God says show them up. Because that's something they don't understand. If you go out in the world and be violent to them, you're not offering them anything new. You're offering them something they already know. Something they're living by. But if you offer them love, you're offering them something that can actually compete against their own world views. You offer them something far better. And if they can see that, there's a great, greater likelihood they'll come forward. 
I want to give you some people who show great compassion in this world. And they started out just regular folks. They were common people. They were nothing special. They were not rich. They did not have families that had money galore. They were just common people who had absolutely nothing. And they made a big difference in life. I came to the slums east of London in 1985. I saw tens of thousands living in the streets. I saw 80,000 women prostituting their bodies, partially because they were immoral, but mostly because they just wanted to live. They needed the money to get food. And he said, that should not be so. Anybody know who I'm talking about? Not me. Be a little hurt. You know the 